Okay. Hello. Okay. Uh, welcome back. I uh, hope you got some refreshments. And uh, those of you that are online, I uh, hope you're back. <laughs> we can't see you. Um, uh, just before we get started, I wanted to um, thank uh, McCarthy Tetro for letting us take over their space, which is uh, very accommodating. And uh, uh, they made this contribution to the climate initiative without really knowing what they were getting into. Um, and, uh, and I have to say that the resources um, that we've made available to all the nations that are um, sitting at the front here um, were provided by uh, Fortis and Enbridge and, and uh, more recently TransCanada and uh, in the background NRCAN who's also here and I, and I got to tell you they didn't know what they were getting into either. Um, they just said that sounds like a good idea here. Uh, why don't you see if other nations want to participate and and that was it and uh, really appreciate everybody's got to take risks when it comes to dealing with these issues and uh, and uh, that goes for them too and they have so we all have to step up in our own way and so really appreciate uh, the support and we're looking forward to providing more support to these nations and other nations to investigate nature-based solutions as we try and figure out how they can truly become uh, part of the solution to climate change. As we've heard, they are. And, uh, and there's lots to discuss around that topic. But first of all, it starts, uh, for the climate initiative, it starts with the nations and what's important to them, um, which is what they're going to talk about right now. And we're going to start um, with Warren uh, Pekit from uh, Niska Nation, um, presenting on behalf of Niska. Over to you, Warren. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Just give me a second to get oriented. So good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Warren Fiquette. I am a registered professional forester in VC. Uh, I have worked with the Niska Nation for almost two decades now. First as their forest resources manager for a, more for a decade, and then their director of lands and resources after that. Uh, I'm thankful for two things right now. Um, first of all, that my presentation isn't going to contradict any of the things that uh, the wise words from our president, Eva, or from our ch uh, chairperson, Brian. So. Uh, and I'm also, of course, really thankful uh, that NLG and Niska Nation have given me the opportunity to present here today. I'd like to start the presentation just by providing an overview of where our project is located. The photo that you're looking at, it shows the mouth of the Nass River you're looking east. Uh, you can see the Niska village of Gingol nestled on the shores. Uh, sort of uh, at the mouth of the, of the Gingle River. And uh, it's there, if you look, it's a small village. But Gingolk is located about 80 kilometers as the crow flies from Prince Rupert. And the Nass Valley can also be accessed by Highway 113, a paved provincial highway from the south, approximately 95 kilometers from Terrace, and also from the northeast via the Nass Forest Service Road and Highway 37 North. The treaty, among other provisions, established a fee simple ownership of approximately 217,000 hectares or 536,000 acres of land from the mouth of the Nass River and inland, including the mineral rights to the center of the earth. This is known as Niska Lands. Niska Lands has approximately 138,000 hectares or 341,000 acres of coastal and interior forests dominated by western hemlock, amabilis fir, sitka and hybrid spruce, red and yellow cedar, pine, cottonwood and red alder. Heavily logged by provincial licensees between 1968 and 1996, 
20, about 25,000 hectares of land was cleared, exp extracting between 15 and 18 million cubic meters, which is about a half a million logging trucks. Niska lands is home to over 5,000 Niska citizens, mainly within the four Niska villages. The forest resources on Niska lands are managed by the Niskalisms government in accordance with the treaty and the Niska Forest Act. So the BC Forest Act uh, minimally applies on Niska lands. The Niska project has three main objectives. The first objective is to restore about 2,000 hectares of degraded valley bottom forest located within the Nass River floodplain and on low bench sites. These restoration activities, no surprise, are intended to transform short-lived brush and alder to longer-lived conifers and cottonwood species, which are what would have been there prior to logging. Access is generally good, as Highway 113 runs the entire length of the Nass River from Gitlik Damix to Lackal Zap. Several main haul roads also provide access to some of the degraded sites. Through GIS analysis and ground truthing, the Forest Carbon Offset Project has identified about 2,000 of, of the available 5,000 hectares initially suitable for restoration. The photo above, the, the, the first photo is really just a, an example of, of uh, what we're looking at as a possible restoration site, heavily dominated with brush and, and alder. And then the lower photo is really just the GIS representation of where ca the candidate sites for our project are, all along the Nass River in an area referred to as the Nass Bottomlands. Our second objective is to increase the forest productivity on sites that are dominated by short-lived species, poor stocking, or for other reasons. Logged in the 1970s to the 1990s, a significant amount of advanced rege regeneration exists on Niska lands. And it's, all of it is still a decade away from being logged as second growth. A significant area of the 2,000 hectares has been identified for a variety of treatments to increase productivity. Uh, the upper photo, just checking the color there, uh, um, is, is, is an, just an example of a well-stocked site. We've got a lot of them. It's a zonal site. Uh, whole, whole hillsides will look like this. Um, and it's a nutrient deficient site. It, it, could, it could use a treatment to increase growth. Uh, many of these sites have been juvenile spaced. So um, the, the, the hundreds of hectares of juvenile spacing has already occurred on Niska lands, and it's just a matter of increasing some productivity. The lower photo uh, shows cedar. In 2003, uh, under the direction of our Council of Elders, NLG established a policy of mandatory planting of cedar on cut blocks harvested under the Niska Forest Act, with the goal of, of ensuring cedar presence for future generations. So the Niska Nation has, since 2003, been spending more money than they need to to replant for uh, cedar on the sites that the N Niska Nation authorizes for harvest. And our third, our third objective relates to implementing ecosystem-based management, improved forest management on Niska lands and potentially outside Niska lands. Uh, we've identified about 12,000 hectares uh, and potentially much larger areas, but initially 12,000 hectares for this purpose. Projects will also seek efficiencies with similar adjacent projects, such as the Great Bear Rainforest Carbon Project. And you'll see the lower photo there actually shows the overlap of the Great Bear Rainforest with Niska Lance. So it's right next door. Examples of activities that we're going to undertake protecting old growth forest, further maintaining stand, uh, forest structure at the stand level, 
protection of threatened and endangered species, and protecting wetlands through increased riparian protections. These things already exist on the lands. They'll be just enhanced. The first five years of our project, for ob our first two objectives, the restoration and the increase of forest productivity, are to, to treat 500 hectares of the Nass River bottomlands at a cost of approximately $2.5 million. And also to treat 500 hectares of these underperforming forests at a cost of approximately $1.5 $1 million. Those aren't big numbers, but let's look at the benefits. Ecological benefits, of course, are, those are obvious. Hydrologic functioning, these are floodplains adjacent to the Nass River. Fish habitat, wildlife habitat, cultural, social, Nass Valley has sustained the Niska Nation for millennia um, and it will need to continue to do so. Carbon, and of course there's carbon sequestered. We're transitioning short-lived species to longer-lived species. Even cottonwood will live three, four hundred years and that's the shortest living of all the species we're, we're intending, to, intending to plant. Down the road, of course, there will be financial benefits, but those will be down the road for the e ecological restoration. But once established, it's unlikely that the Nass bottomlands would ever be logged again. It's at the discretion of the Niska Nation, and in my opinion, it's never happened. I'm, I'm seeing if Brian's nodding. Please nod. <laughs> <laughs> the first five years of EBM, IFM, and uh, sorry, uh, and we'll see a number of actions, including a reduction of harvest levels. The AAC on Niska lands is 130,000 cubic meters per year. This is a calculation; it's not a determination. Uh, NLG conducted an, uh, an inventory in about 2016 made to make this uh, calculation. Full inventory is probably not needed to proceed with this project. However, a recalculation of the AAC will likely be done. Retention of approximately 7% of the harvestable areas through, a conversion strat through conservation strategies I mentioned earlier over a minimum of about 12,000 hectares. The main tools for implementing ecosystem-based management and improved forest management will be through establishing, modifying directives, policies, and if, ne if necessary, statutes. And of course, the Niska Nation can always enter into contracts. Project stability on Niska lands the Niska lands is owned by the Niska Nation. It says no possibility of ownership of the lands being lost. The Niska Nation can create legislation as specified in the treaty and enter into long-term agreements in accordance with those laws and laws of general application. For example, the current Niska Forest Act provides for agreements of up to 100 years for ecosystem restoration and carbon rights. These agreements are intended to be used in areas where the importance of future timber harvesting is far exceeded by the ecological, hydrological, fisheries, wildlife, et cetera, et cetera, values of the lands. And then currently, Niska Nation has not entered into any forest carbon offset agreement or, or any project. Project risks. Restoration has risks, especially when you're dealing with the Nass River floodplain. Uh, we know this. Uh, these are flooding, wildlife, and of course, this can't be done without multi-year funding uh, confirmed. For example, in around 2010, Niskalism's government entered into agreement with Shell Canada to conduct a pilot project restoring a portion of the lands for the purposes of generating carbon offsets. Although funding was pulled when Shell was purchased uh, by another company, the project did provide 
some insights into some into these challenges. So we know that flooding is going to be an issue, and we know we're going to need more than one year's worth of funding. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is an expensive project, so the funding, three to five years worth of funding, is is paramount. Many of these sites, it's not that they haven't tried to put trees back on these sites before they have, um, but the funding has never envisioned the establishment of trees would annually need treatments, annually need brushing, and replacement of some planted trees after um, things happen on floodplains. I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but we, we've estimated the cost of uh, about $5,000 per hectare uh, for the ecological restoration. Project risks of forest improvement. Uh, first couple of years of funding is important. Fire events are occur infrequently on Niska lands. They're not expected to be a factor for about 50 years in many of these areas. Uh, forest and insects are present on Niska lands. We have uh, Dothostroma needle rust on our replanted pine. We have spruce beetle. We have the white pine leader weevil. And we have um, endemic levels of mountain pine beetle, endemic levels of all pests, actually. Uh, these are managed very closely on an annual basis by Niska Lisbon's government and BC. How does a project get approved on Niska lands? You, you have a message, Alex. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> doesn't look important. It doesn't look important. It's okay. Uh, project approval. How, how do you approve a project on Niska lands? Um, a, pro a project that proceeds after approval of the uh, Niska Lisbon's government executive, of which um, you, we've, we've heard from today. Additional approvals would be required. The Director of Lands and Resources has uh, a lot of authority under the Niska Forest Act, and he would also be required to provide some approvals as the project proceeded. The decision-making process on Niska lands is simple, uh, but it does require a process to be followed. Uh, it's a well-established process. Um, my photo doesn't do that building justice. That is the NLG administration building. I worked in it for 14 years. Uh, it's a fantastic building if you ever get a chance to see it. And then the lower photo is a representation of the House of Laws, the Wilpsayuk Niska, um, which is uh, sitting uh, and uh, part, of that, uh, part of that building. And if you get a chance to sit through uh, a session of the Wilpsayuk Niska, uh, it, is, it, is worth that, it is worth the time. Project revenue. The project envisions multiple streams of revenue. B the bundling of offset activities is intended to enable early offsets to fund restoration and forest improvements, high initial upfront costs. Pretty simple. The above graphs from our project feasibility report provide different revenue projections for both the voluntary and compliance markets. The general consensus is that price of carbon isn't getting cheaper. While a 100-year agreement may seem long, from a NISCA perspective, they've been on the land for over 10,000 years. And it was best, send up, best summed up to me by our CEO that just said, well, we're not going anywhere. So 100 years is, not, is nothing to the NISCA nation. In summary, even during treaty negotiations, as Brian mentioned, it took 113 years. The Niska Nation has recognized the importance of ecological value in restoring the forests surrounding the Nass River. For example, Chapter 5 of the treaty, Section 72 and 73, are assurances from both the federal government and the provincial government that if any funding becomes available to restore the NAS bottomlands, the Niska Nation will remain eligible for that funding. 
The NISC and Nation have si since 2010 recognized that the carbon offsets may provide a meaningful option to fund the improvement and restoration of forests on NISCA lands within a working forest and other land-based commercial developments. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Warren. Um, so the way we're going to uh, work this is if you could uh, just make note of questions that you may have. Um, we have a series of presentations, and then we're going to have a Q&A uh, at the end. And um, some of the presentations, like Warren's, include some analysis of what the carbon uh, potential is, and others don't. Uh, and the last presenter, uh, Krista, uh, who's with the CORA, who's provided a lot of technical support to many of the projects, has done a kind of a roll-up. So that technical information that you may be wondering about as we go through is going to be presented at the end as a kind of a roll-up of what we're describing as a portfolio of potential MBS projects. Uh, also, as you can tell, we've started on the coast um, with the Heisla and the Niska, and we're going to make our way across the province. And um, so we just, we're going over the mountains now into uh, the carrier territories uh, and uh, Saika's First Nation. And Cassandra Turbide is their uh, environment manager and is very passionate about nature-based solutions in her way. Um, and so look forward to uh, your presentation, Cassandra. Welcome. Hari Bandara Hunzu, Cassandra Turbide, Spoozy, Nulk Ayot and Dusto, Saikas, Tse Hasya, Bonnie Johnny Slu, Inkes, Claude Turbide, Spa, Hunisti and Jan, Musqueam, Slewatooth, and Squahomish, Keo Nasja. So, hello, good morning. My name is Cassandra Johnny Turbide. I'm a part of the Nulk Ayot or the Frog Clan, and I'm from Saikas First Nation. So I situated myself this morning by introducing my parents, Bonnie, Johnny, and Claude Turbide, and also said that I'm honored to be here today on the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish territories. So to situate ourselves and where we are located and who we are um, as people, Sykes is a part of the larger Dakath Nation. We're also known as the Carrier Nation. Our main reserve is located near Vanderhoof, BC. Uh, which is about an hour west of Prince George. And within our territory, the cumulative effects from forestry, agriculture, hydroelectric dams, recreation, and road development have seriously constrained our people's ability to exercise our rights within our KO or our territory. And we see the effects of industrial development in the algal blooms within our lakes that are closest to our community, um, Nalkai Bun and Tachek Bun and also the decline of many species that our people rely on, such as salmon, moose, grizzly bear, and fur bears. So in the pre-feasibility study that ECORA did on forest carbon nature solutions for Saika's KO, they looked at the potential of what we call our biodiversity management areas. So using the natural range of variability, Saika's and the larger Kaur Sikani nations, also known as CSFNs, created a risk assessment in 2018 through the Provincial Environmental Stewardship Initiative. Uh, so for reference, the total CSFN territories is around 8 million hectares, and it includes the communities of Stalatten, Nodlewitten, Nakazli, Klazden, Tsilkazko, and Takla. So through the risk assessment, it created a model that started with values that were determined by the communities, and they were values that were most important to us. We couldn't and capture everything, um, so biodiversity was one of the main values. Uh, we also looked at watershed health, riparian ecosystems and fish, as well as moose. And the model also looked at natural disturbance units and ecosystems and targets for uh, eco ecosystem representation. So through this process, the communities created uh, different indicators and scores for each of these values. So we looked at old forests that are greater than 140 years. We looked at the stand age of the, the sites here that you can see on the map, uh, patch size, human influence, young natural forests, 
moose habitat, riparian areas, uh, watershed sensitivity, and it identified spatial units for different scenarios that looked at different management options at uh, policy level or business as usual, as well as minimum, medium, and maximum risk thresholds. So as noted, these are what became the biodiversity management areas. So in the map, you can see uh, the BMAs within SICA's KO. And in 2018, SICA's adopted the maximum natural range of variability through a band council resolution. And it states that given the seriousness of impacts on SICA's rights, title, and interests, a full suite of accommodation measures must be applied to the max NRV, NRV or BMA areas to either avoid, mitigate, or offset the impacts. So through this process, the CSFNs also negotiated an interim deferral or an avoidance of the BMA areas with the 11 major licensees within the Prince George Timber Supply Area. Um, and this was this interim deferral is to go until further resource management planning can occur with the province. So now communities as SICAs, um, and you'll hear from Stellatin next, are looking at how nature-based solutions can be part of our strategy and solution for managing our forests into the future. Uh, so next I'm going to show um, our forestry film, and I'm glad we can share the whole 13 minutes of it. We were only going to play a couple minutes initially. Um, and it looks generally at the problems uh, with forestry within our territory, the impacts that it's had on our, our people, our territory, our culture, our way of life. Uh, also show some of the work that our monitoring program does with forestry and um, an example of how relationships with our community can be. And also our hopes for improved forest management. So with that, I'll let the, the film go. Saika's territory is logged out. We have no more old growth trees. Well, with all the fire, the beetle, and the uh, industry coming in there, we have nothing left in our territory. Our territory is over a million hectares, and about 800,000 hectares of that is forested land. It's just erasing our culture and our heritage and the way we were with the land. When you look out in our territory, all I see is devastation. 50, 60 years of logging has impacted our territory. They've changed the landscape. Our landscape used to contain a good diversity for our people. We had moose, we had all kinds of animals, fish. And now it's, it's not like that. You have to go out there and look for themselves. Picture tells a thousand more, right? Clear cutting hurts me. It really hurts me. There's going to be nothing left. We'll drive ourselves into the ground. <laughs> We do a pre-harvest, which is before the logging cut blocks and all that happen. We come and we do a walkthrough. And we have maps. We put GPS points and pictures. We have 140 and 210 and 211. 140 and 206. <laughs> Block numbers. There's like four in the area, all down along this little gully. We point out wildlife features, drainages, and important areas for the land. Look at the dead trees, the live trees, what trees are here. And then we find the places that we would like to save and we make our little ideas and try to bring them to the loggers and see what they can do. 
like leaving areas for moose, leaving trees, leaving riparian areas, like bigger buffers around lakes and meadows and streams. I don't see very much of it out here. They could talk about it all they want before they log it. But when they do log it, most of those little tiny recommendations we make don't come to life. We've asked them to stay out of the drainage where they put their road, made the water run that way instead of down to this little lake here. It changed quite a bit through over harvesting. And what I've seen over time was that there was a lot of waste and the mechanical harvesting was just devastated to the land. The land is drying up and dying. The creeks and lakes are not useful anymore. It'd be nice for them to leave little areas that have the moss and have the little trees to shade it, you know. It will help rebuild itself quicker. There's a lot of little things like that that we fight for and there's like maybe a quarter of what we asked. There are some blocks that we advocated really hard for to get some changes and unfortunately they weren't implemented. It is in caribou habitat, some very important streams. It wasn't just the recent cut blocks but also the various stages of cut blocks that have happened over time and really changing that ecosystem that was once there. There's no more berries, there's no more medicines that we can collect in areas like this. And more and more log, the less we have, we gotta travel a lot farther to get what we need. When I was very young, my mom used to go out our back door on the reserve and go maybe about 200 feet to gather medicines. Now we go a couple hours into the mountains. It brings a tear to your eye to see this. It also brings a tear to my eye to see that our whole territory is turning into one big pine tree plantation. This, we want to change. It, it can't be like this anymore. It really leaves you in a sense of hopelessness. What they're doing is legal. You can meet with the companies and share in depth your concerns. When they don't get implemented, you just don't feel respected. You don't feel like your concerns are taken seriously enough. We're not gonna take this anymore. We are not gonna take this anymore where people come in and pillage the land and leave it barren and walk out of here. That's, it's not gonna happen. The day of just doing whatever you want to First Nations is done. This is a new generation. My grandparents and parents' time, they were more um, go with the flow. And they were trained like, to, to not make trouble. Me, I'm a rebel. We had jurisdiction over this land before Canada was even a country, before British Columbia was a province. We still have jurisdiction because this land is unceded. Until we actually lose a war, cede and release our territory, it's ours. You can't steal it, but that's basically what's happened. With colonization and residential school, it really put our people on a reserve. We were forced to be there. I was a residential school survivor too. Got separated from my, my family and my parents like everybody else did to the Jack residential school. So we're lucky we, we survive. The band didn't really have much say over how the lands were managed. Today you see the social issues that we have and People just are hurt and people have a very hard time. You gotta dream bigger. We should have equity in projects. We should have some ownership of what happens around us, especially if it's on our own landscape. Things are changing and we are gonna have a say in what happens in our territory. If we don't have a relationship, we're not gonna consent. They don't have our consent to be in our territory. We're going to sit down and we're going to look at how is this project going to affect our landscape, how is it going to affect our community, and then the future. Reconciliation is everybody's responsibility. 
it's not just we're good, it's creating an equal space for us. It's having that authority and jurisdiction to say how our lands will be managed. We're not opposed to forestry, but want to make sure it's done in a way that's environmentally sustainable. Sustainability is a big part of it for us. I think we have a very uh, positive working relationship with Nechako Lumber, have had for a number of years, but that's not the case with all of the forest companies in the region. We've built a relationship and that's the most important thing for us. Once you build that relationship and you have trust, then you know what, you could work together. We can work together, I believe that. They've been incredibly open. They've been patient in terms of helping us understand what their objectives are and what's important to them. At the same time, we spent the time to explain what's important to us and to go on the, on the journey together. We have a joint planning process in our agreement with Nechako to ensure that Saikaza stewardship or environmental stewardship principles are adhered to. As holders of rights and title on the land base, we have to make sure that we're working to preserve their values on the land. We have a lot of members employed here, creating additional economic benefit to the community. When we become partners and we're able to take care of our own, we could build our houses, we could build our health stations, we could build our daycares. We've been able to put together a, a partnership that I think will stand the test of time and position both parties for long-term success. Our interest is that we can work together to ensure that forestry is here for the millennium. We're in a new age now. We can't log like we're in the 50s anymore. This is 2021. We're smarter. We know better about the land. We have better equipment. We, all we have to do is do it. Who's doing the layout? Who's running the ribbon? Do they see what we see when they're doing it? My hope is that we can get people thinking about biodiversity more and quit planting plantations up high. Having our people feeling safe on the land, feeling respected, being able to come out here and feel pride in our territory. Only thing I hope is that uh, everybody works together because we have to think about our little children. What we're trying to do here is for the children of Saikas so that they can grow up and live a happy, healthy life and enjoy a quality of life that other people get to enjoy. I'm passionate about it because I don't want my children and the next generation to have to do it. At least I know that they won't have to have the same fight I did. There are future leaders. I want them to know who they are, their language, their culture, and that they be proud of who they are. Big companies are not gonna, they'll be moved on. They'll be moved on, you know, and, but we're gonna be here forever. You know, we don't wanna be the ones to tell them, oh, if this used to be like this. This is what it was like in our day, like our grandparents are now telling us. We wanna be able to say, look at what we did. <laughs> look at the difference that we made. Jelia, thank you. Makes me emotional every time I watch it. <laughs> I've watched it so many times, but uh, I think it really tells our story, um, the situation that we're facing. And uh, a lot of what we're doing through nature-based solutions are projects that we already have underway. Uh, our relationships with the forestry companies, uh, increasing those riparian areas, as you heard from our monitors. Uh, we have an ecosystem restoration plan that we're working on with our community. And so uh, we see nature-based solutions as being a really important long-term solution for our community to really solidify these areas and projects that we're already working on. So um, in the report that ECORA did for us, they also looked at improved forest management 
Um, so some of the things that they noted in the report, but it's not exhaustive, um, is looking at things like restoring red alder and a diversity of species other than pine and spruce. As you've seen, we have a lot of pine monocrops in our territory. Uh, repopulating berries and other culturally important food and medicinal plants and retaining important areas like spiritual sites, uh, riparian er areas, they're so important. <laughs> You'll probably hear that a lot throughout the presentations today and uh, rare, rare ecosystems. And again, restoring forests to a healthy condition at both the stand level and a landscape level so they can be fully utilized by the wildlife that our community depends on, um, but also the community. So in the report, it also talks about how uh, an NBS project like this would require a planning process to integrate the activities into a landscape strategy. And so we see this potential through the resource management planning process that I mentioned that we're gonna be undertaking with the province and also through our uh, licenses that we have with forest companies in our territory and also our ecosystem restoration plan. So there's all these different pieces that we're moving forward. Um, and with that, I'd like to say Masi Snachalia for the opportunity to talk, speak to you today about potential nature-based solutions in our territory. Um, as you can tell, our people are living with the effects and the decisions of the past that, are, that were made in isolation without our consent. And given the state of our territory and climate change moving forward, it's critical now more than ever that we consider and move forward with these types of projects that restore rather than strictly extract resources from our KO as has been done in the past. So with that, I'll say Owetza. Um, that's all for now. Thanks. Thank you so much, <clears throat> and I know we're all glad that you were able to play the whole video. Um, it was really great. Thank you. Um, our next speaker uh, is from Stalatin uh, First Nation, uh, adjacent to uh, Saikas, and that's uh, Doug Kazamel, who's going to be joining us online, and is, uh, I like Cassandra, I think the environment manager for Stalatin First Nation. Over to you, Doug. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Doug Casimel. I'm a member of the Frog Clan from the Salatin First Nation. I'm going to make a point of working on introducing myself and my language like Cassandra did. That was a great job, Cassandra. Also a great video from SICAS and their Land and Resources Department. I think that video really sums up why we're here. Um, I'm also the manager of the Tunesa Nikea Stewardship Department. Uh, Tunesa Nikea means sunlight reflecting off of the water in the carrier language and i'm happy to be joining you from treaty four uh, here in regina saskatchewan um, my presentation is just going to be kind of going over where we are where we're situated and some of our um, hopes and aspirations uh, with nature-based solutions um, also looking at how we're looking to a future that kind of um, aligns our values with with uh, creating new economies. And then we'll just we'll be ending it. Oops. Um, our people have lived in a Stellaco River River area for thousands of years. Um, every year, the sockeye salmon return to the Stellaco River. In the old days, they would turn the river red. Uh, now it is only speckled in red spots. Uh, what we're seeing is climate change and other factors are impacting the very foundations of our culture. Um, if you look at this map, you can see we're, this is Francois Lake and this is Fraser Lake and we're loca located right here. Uh, we do share our territory with our neighbors from the Nadli Wattin. And um, that's just important to, to recognize that, uh, that about our neighbors. Our, ter our traditional territory is located in the central interior of British Columbia. We do share portions of our territory, as I mentioned, with our neighbors, Nadli Wattin Nation. We are a member of the Kerry Secondy Tribal Council. 
our tribal council, if you look at it in the map, uh, is probably larger than some of the, the smaller countries in, in Europe. Um, our, it includes seven nations. Um, those nations are the Tlazco First Nation, Nadli Watten, Saikas, Stalatin, Takla First Nation, Tlazten Nation, and the Wet'suwet'en First Nation. A little bit about our, our lands and planning. Um, we've just received a replaceable forest license from the province of BC. Um, as uh, one of the folks involved with negotiating uh, this long, long negotiation, uh, David Lugie he said, this is quite historical. It actually gives us the ability to have a, a real form of land tenure on our traditional territory. Um, we're working to action that um, this has just happened in September. That's uh, quite new. It's been it's been a long time coming. Uh, we've got a First Nations community woodlot. Um, there are fisheries taking lots of fisheries activity in our territory. That's something we want to get more involved in. Uh, there's tourism, eco Aboriginal eco tourism potential. Uh, we've got mining activity. Um, uh, we have an old mine in Daco Mines. The challenging thing about this mine is it's located right close to uh, the end of Francois Lake, and that's where the, the lake goes into the Stalaco River, which goes into Fraser Lake, which goes into the Nadley River. So that's something that we're monitoring. Um, that that, um, that mine is in care and maintenance. Uh, we have another new mine coming through our territory. Uh, that's the, the Blackwater uh, Gold Mine owned by Artemis. Uh, we're working with that company to try to ensure that uh, this, this development is done in a good way. Uh, there's various explorations uh, taking place within, uh, mineral exploration taking place within our territory. Um, we also have a, a wind data monitoring tower to see if we can build a, a wind energy farm in our territory. Uh, the coastal gas link natural gas pipeline is currently being built. We're seeing that there's a, a shift in global geopolitics and we may see um, other gas lines pass through our territories looking for tidewater uh, following our, our old uh, trading trails to the coast. In the old days, our lives really centered around the water, the forest, salmon, moose. Um, it was all these things that were intertwined to, to create, a, create a success for us in, in, in our world. If you look on the left, that's a beautiful picture of Francois Lake. And um, on the right is a, a picture overlooking Francois Lake, but it's uh, the, the headwaters of the Stalaco, Stalaco River. That's one of the best um, uh, trout uh, fly fishing rivers in the world. It's just quite beautiful. But if, um, if we were to look around the corner here, we'd, we'd see the Ndaku, uh, Ndaku Mine, which is on Karen Maintenance. And you can also see the Tailings Pond. So um, that's one of the things that we're, we're watching and monitoring is just this um, different exploration in mineral exploration that's taking place in our territory. Here you can see a smokehouse with, with salmon. Um, salmon is really key and a foundational piece to our culture. Smoking and curing salmon for the winter helped our peoples to prosper in a challenging landscape. It is through our ancestors and their hard work that we find ourselves here today. My hands are up to our ancestors, for I'm sure that they are watching us. We once traded with the coastal First Nations for oolican oil, or grease as it was also called. There is nothing, there's nothing quite like dipping dried salmon in oolican oil, and I'm hoping that we can rekindle those trade networks, and, and um, I can't wait to be uh, dipping some dried salmon in, in oolican oil again.
Our people are also tied to the moose. In recent years, the number of moose have been diminishing. Throughout the Cary Second E territory, there have been areas, areas identified as biodiversity management areas. And Cassandra kind of brought this up and showed some of the maps that are involved with these uh, uh, BMAs. These areas are often riparian areas and they're old growth forest. These are the areas that are important to the life cycles of moose. These are the areas that we would like to protect now and into the future. And it is these areas that we use to model our nature-based solution. These BMA areas covered 55,000 hectares of land in our traditional territory. And again, we, we share portions of our territory with the Natalie Witten, so we will have to work with them as we move forward um, uh, into the future and, and explore nature-based solutions in our shared territories. Um, we'd also like to advance projects uh, that regenerate habitat for salmon and moose. So we saw that the um, um, we had different folks that have already been doing that. It looks like the the Nish the uh, the Nishka were, were doing some regenerative projects. Uh, we would also like to do some uh, regenerative product projects, uh, so helping to regenerate uh, our lands. Some of the nature. So this slide is just about nature-based solutions. We are we're interested in. Uh, carbon credits. I know we've got the province here, so we just want to let them know that we're very interested in, in um, working with them as we move forward to figure out a way how we can share atmospheric benefits. Um, I think our people aren't going anywhere. Um, those these kind of projects really align with with our core values. Um, we're interested in regener regenerative projects, as I mentioned, Aboriginal and ecotourism. Uh, more nation-supported fisheries, uh, the idea of a circular economy. I think that's something that just um, the Western business world is, you know, catching up with uh, indigenous kind of thinking uh, and looking at circular economies and, and using the most of our resources and, and really being thoughtful about uh, our waste streams. I'm also interested in vertical integrated industries um, creating more employment, creating more opportunities, creating joint ventures, um, and just try to create a, a better economy built uh, more health from a healthy perspective from the ground up. Um, we're really hopeful that there will be revenues for protection, for protecting BMAs. Um, we're also hoping that there will be revenues to help some of these regeneration projects. Um, as I mentioned, these, this kind of approach uh, creates an economic alignment with our traditional values. Uh, we are very interested in earth-friendly activities and technologies. And um, actually, this because it's new, this approach gives our nation time to build capacity as we move forward. Um, so sometimes going slow is not, not bad. Oops, a little bit of a lag there. So nature, we see nature-based solutions as a, a key to unlock unseen and unrecognized economic potential. So what we're seeing is that this approach empowers our nation through economic solutions and provides the resources needed to regenerate and restore ecosystems. So that's a common theme that I think you're going to see with every nation. We're not interested in just simply an extractive type of uh, economic development. We're interested in a holistic kind of approach where we are, we, we, we take what we need. Usually we only take what we need, not more. And then we kind of create a, a circular approach. And we, after we do a project, we want to make sure that the, the ecosystem is restored to it's not as much of it, you know, we want it to be as natural as it was before, uh, if not better. Um, for us, this nature-based solutions have been a kind of a, a missing piece of the economic puzzle. Uh, and it really encourages that alignment uh, with development. 
and uh, our traditional values. Um, we're hoping that we can create careers for folks uh, managing our natural capital systems. And, um, you know, we're hoping that that can go on for, for millennia, if need be. So with that, um, I just want to say uh, thank you uh, to all my relations, Snachalia, for listening to my words. And we also want to thank uh, Acora for drafting our pre-feasibility -feas study of forest carbon nature-based solutions on our traditional territory. And also, we look forward to this journey, and we're excited to journey with other nations and groups who are part of the uh, First Nations Climate Initiative. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Doug. Uh, that was great. And um, uh, if any of you have been watching the news lately, um, uh, the Saikas and, and Stalako nations uh, are also known as the Nachaco nations. Um, and they're not just fighting for the land, they're also fighting for the water and um, trying to restore the sturgeon. And unfortunately, uh, a dozen of those sturgeon died in early September for reasons that we don't know exactly, um, other than the Nachaco only has about 70% of the flow that it used to have. And uh, the nations are working hard to restore that river um, as part of the lifeblood of their cultures. So well, good luck with that. Um, so we're moving east. And for those nations that are here or online and wondering how come we're not uh, part of this, um, it's only because of the, the lack of communication. Um, and any, any of you that are interested in participating in this project, the doors open permanently for as long as we are doing it and uh, would welcome uh, your participation in whatever capacity you'd like to participate. Uh, you just have to reach out to uh, uh, FNCI, uh, info at FNCI online. Um, with, that, with that, we're going uh, east and we're going to get go over the Rocky Mountains um, into Treaty 8. Uh, we'll be into Treaty 8 before we get over the Rockies, but on the other side of Treaty 8 is Moberly Lake, uh, and two of the nations that are here live on Moberly Lake. And West Moberly uh, First Nation is the first up <clears throat> with the Robert Beaton. Um, those of you that are all sort of uh, super into carbon stuff uh, would know Robert. Um, he's, he's been around these things for a long time. Um, and I think we have a recorded presentation uh, from Robert. Uh, so over to you, Robert, if you're listening. Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Robert Seaton, and I'm here uh, speaking on behalf of the West Moberly First Nations and the carbon project that they have uh, going on. Uh, and I do want to thank FNCI and all the organizers of this uh, of this conference for putting this together. I think this is a great project um, that uh, you know is really going to help advance some of the capacity that really Indigenous nations in BC have to change management of the land and to, as a result, change atmospheric carbon. So a little background on West Moberly First Nations. Uh, the West Moberly First Nations are based in Moberly Lake in northeastern BC. West Moberly is one of the BC signatories to Treaty 8, and as you've probably heard, the courts recently found in the I decision that the ability of Treaty 8 nations to exercise the rights guaranteed under the treaty have been severely impaired by the cumulative effects of crown management of those lands. And that's, that's critical to the development of this project. West Moberly traditional territory has been impacted not only by timber harvest, which is pretty common across many nations territory in BC, but also by major hydro dams that radically disrupted wildlife migration patterns, by oil and gas development, by agriculture, by wind power development, by non-Indigenous hunting and trapping, and by major rights of way for electricity transmission, pipelines, and highways. As you can imagine, the cumulative impact of all of these layers of management, which really were never coordinated, has been severe. For instance, local populations of caribou are threatened with extirpation. Key cultural practices have been made difficult or impossible. And many traditional use resources are diminished 
or else so fragmented that they cannot be efficiently used. West Moberly First Nations are currently involved in a large number of initiatives and processes aimed at reducing the impacts of past management on the environment, exercise of treaty rights, and culture. For instance, West Moberly is a signatory to the Caribou Partnership Agreement, along with the Soto First Nations, BC, and Canada. The goal of the agreement is to expeditiously restore caribou to self-sustaining populations which can support traditional harvest. But you can imagine doing that in a fragmented landscape like this is not simple. It's not so simple as a single setting aside a park or something. It's a much bigger and more complex problem. Achieving the ability to fully exercise treaty rights in a culturally appropriate way and ensure sustainable populations of species like caribou is, as I say, highly complex. Conventional ways of looking at the land by breaking it up into a mosaic of discrete areas of land, really don't work to get to where we need to get to. You know, the, the sort of polygon approach, the inventory approach that we all, we've all used for many, many years, it, it really doesn't serve the goals we now have. The nature and capacity of the land changes over time scales, multiple time and spatial scales. And so those polygons are constantly changing. Key use areas of the land will vary not only with the seasons, but also with history, climate, and need. And I'll give a sort of a personal example of that. I make a significant part of my food supply from the land as well as from stuff that I grow. And the pattern of land use that I personally do changes from year to year substantially depending on the productivity of specific wild species, the timing of weather, um, fires and so on. So where, for instance, last year we had some very large and very good crops of certain berry species, this year we have almost none. And that's changing how I use the land from year to year. And, and we need to figure out how to reflect those kinds of changes and that dynamic as well in how we manage. And of course, then if you have a fire, that can change everything again, depending on the intensity and extent of that fire. The other thing I would say is that conventional analysis of the land also frequently focuses on the percentage of land in a particular state, how much old growth, how much young cereal, et cetera, et cetera. And we've all heard those numbers. But the problem is that those metrics ignore the enormous impact that fragmentation of the landscape by management activities, and particularly in this case by uncoordinated multiple management activities, has on almost all of the key cultural and ecological values. Currently, the average patch size within a significant portion of West Morberly territory is a couple of orders of magnitude smaller than it would have been prior to the commencement of crown management. So that's a huge change. And you can imagine the difference between a 3,000 square, a 3,000 kilometer, or pardon me, hectare um, patch of old growth and 310 hectare patches of old growth. They're completely different things with completely different ecological and cultural functions. So being able to sustain cultural practices, exercise treaty rights, and sustain species and ecosystem thus requires new ways of thinking about the land. And, you know, I would add to that that this is particularly the case in the context of global climate change, which we're all facing, I think, which we all can totally see already in our own home places, and which introduces a whole nother scale of magnitude, scale and magnitude of change through time. And I'll give an example of that from, from the West Morberly traditional territory, and I know this impacts the Soto territory as well. Um, currently, there are significant portions of that territory are southern boreal. So they're essentially spruce, pine, aspen dominated forests with moose as a major animal species, uh, beaver, and so on. Within 80 years, under current projections of climate change, those some of those areas are projected to be Rocky Mountain Douglas fir, with a typical animal being an elk, uh, a very different ecosystem. You can imagine that when we start thinking about how to manage a landscape that's going to change that radically and still support cultural practices, traditional uses, you know, and all the other uses we put the land to, it's an enormously complex problem. So thinking about all of those issues underlies the development of the West Morberly First Nations Woodland License. Uh, the Woodland License is going to cover a significant portion of the Upper Moberly Watershed, so above Moberly Lake, and some adjoining lands. And the Carbon Project, the West Morberly Carbon Project, is one of the elements of management of the Woodland License, and reducing atmospheric carbon is a key goal of the project. However, management of the land through a carbon lens 
is as likely to result in damage and to cultures and ecosystems as management through a timberlands. Any sort of single goal management is likely to cause huge problems. Carbon centric management, for instance, could result in the reduction of natural disturbance processes, potentially natural, dis natural diversity, could result in the development of higher risk fuel loadings and could ultimately result in catastrophic fire, particularly when combined with climate change at scales that we've never seen before and that the ecosystem can't handle. So <clears throat> we have to be very careful not to think about any single value as being the driving force behind management. And West Mobile's management approach to the woodland license will thus take into account a wide range of values, including a significant number of culturally and ecologically important non-timber species, wildlife, cultural use patterns, and resilience over multiple timescales and change drivers, as well as timber and carbon. And the key point here is that none of those values will be primary in driving management. If you look at how we do it conventionally today, basically for most of the forested areas, we manage for timber. And then we put on top of that some constraints for say wildlife or for other uses or for et cetera, et cetera. But they're all seen as being constraints on timber harvest and timber management. They're not fundamental, fundamentally the management goal. We need to change that paradigm and West Morberly is aiming to change that paradigm in the, in, in the woodland license. And it's not to say that timber isn't part of it, but it's that all of these values will be fundamentally equal across the landscape and then they'll be weighted and the weighting will change from time to time depending on what's critical. And so for instance, right now with caribou threatened with extirpation, clearly caribou are critical. And so we may, buy, we may bias towards caribou and away from some other values, but that will rebalance over time. And so we, we're, we're looking at a fundamental change in management paradigm and a fundamental re-understanding of the landscape. This management system is expected to significantly increase the amount of atmospheric carbon stored on the land as compared with the current business as usual management, which is essentially clear-cut harvesting uh, over a 80 or 100 year rotation. However, it's also important to be clear that management may include actions which tend to reduce carbon storage over the short or medium term in some areas. For instance, there are areas in the West Mobile, in, within the proposed woodland license where uh, harvest resulted in increase in black huckleberry production. Timber harvest is not always reducing everything. The problem is that the harvested areas were then replanted with monoculture pine at relatively high densities. And within 20 to 30 years, those stands are going to wipe out black huckleberry production. <clears throat> Clearly those stands are good for carbon. They are rapidly growing. They're taking a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere and so on. But what we're likely to do is go in and cut half of those trees down in a patchy way, not in an even pattern so that we continue to have black huckleberry production in the area while still, while still having pine growing there and while still capturing carbon. But we will have reduced the amount of carbon captured compared with a sort of conventional timber centric tree farming management because we're balancing it with other values. Management will also include large scale restoration activities designed to particularly to reduce landscape fragmentation and working with the Soto First Nations, West Morberly is already undertaking a significant restoration program in the wider landscape designed to reduce the impacts of fragmentation and in this case, particularly roads on predator prey dynamics and the populations of caribou in this case. So those kinds of restoration activities will also be part of the overall management and therefore will be part of the, the management that drives the carbon project. Development of the West Morberly Carbon Project is occurring in parallel with the development of the total management picture. It's not like we already have the total management picture. It's incredibly complicated and it, and it requires a huge amount of community dialogue and, and it requires getting into focus all of the enormous knowledge that community members have about this area and the resources within it. And, and really they know more than the ministry does in most regards. And so bringing all that knowledge together in a way that we can manage this land, it, it takes time and it takes a lot of work, but it's the only way to manage the land in a way that's sustainable and culturally positive. Uh, so to date, we've started some of those dialogues. There's a long way to go with that, with that discussion and with that, with, with bringing all that knowledge into focus. Uh, we've also undertaken just to understand the, the carbon part of the project, initial timber supply and carbon modeling to try to understand the likely scale of atmospheric carbon reductions achievable in this context and to understand what resources will be made available by the carbon project 
to support the land management. And I want to be very clear that the carbon project, although we're not doing carbon centric management, the carbon project is a critical piece of this puzzle because without the potential revenues from carbon offsets, we wouldn't be able to undertake the kind of management that we need in order to make this whole thing work. So the carbon is a key part. It's just that it can't be the management driver. So that's, a, that's essentially a summary of where we're at with this thing. Obviously, a long ways to go. We're working closely with the provincial government on the on developing the, uh, the Woodland license. And I think, uh, you know, we'll get there. Uh, it's going to take some more time. Uh, and the carbon project will come along with that. But uh, yeah, I just that's a reasonable overview. And thank you so much for uh, taking time to uh, be here and listen to my presentation. Um, and I'm sorry I'm not there to take any questions, but I'm always happy if anybody wants to reach out, I'm happy to discuss the project in more detail. And uh, yeah, so thanks a lot and uh, hope to see you all soon. Uh, thank you to uh, Robert and to Wes Moberly. Uh, and Wes Moberly is continuing um, with this project uh, along with the other nations. Uh, there's lots more to do. Um, so we have uh, two more nations to hear from and then the roll up. So uh, take a deep breath, get some more oxygen in your brains because um, we don't have time to take a break. And this is super interesting stuff. Uh, thank you to everyone that's spoken so far. Um, it's really inspiring and uh, even though some of us have been uh, through every step of the way, uh, I'm still learning things as we go. Um, so we're going to Soto First Nation, who shares a lot of territory uh, with West Moberly, uh, and Gary Ray is going to be speaking on behalf of Soto. Over to you, Gary. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is an honor to be here today uh, to speak on behalf of Soto First Nations. Uh, my name's Gary Ray. I'm a negotiator, a negotiations advisor for Soto First Nations. Um, I'd like to start by um, introducing my colleague, Ryan Mackay, is in the back. Ryan is our um, manager um, of strategic um, initiatives. He is part of the Treaty Rights and Environmental Protection Team, TREP team, and um, I would uh, offer that you reach out to talk to Ryan or myself at any times during the breaks about uh, questions that may come up as I go through the presentation. Um, as you've heard from Robert and from others, uh, uh, SOTO is part of the Treaty 8 Nations. Uh, the Treaty 8 territory is approximately 25% of British Columbia. There's eight nations that are located up there. Um, SOTO, there's about 4,600 Treaty 8 members in BC, and SOTO has about uh, 1,235 or 27% of Treaty 8 members are from SOTO. Um, there's been a history, as Robert said, of the economic development in our territories. The, um, I want you to think about this. The hydroelectric uh, electricity produced in British Columbia, when Site C comes online, 45% of all the electricity will come out of the Northeast from the three dams that are up there, 45%. So half the electricity in this room comes from the Northeast. The other aspect, when you think about natural gas, 100% of the production of natural gas comes out of, out of the Northeast. The majority of it comes out of what's referred to as the Motney Play. That's that purple area in the map there. So every time you turn on your, your heat at home, every time you turn on your stove, natural gas stove, that's natural gas that came out of the lands of Treaty 8. Liquid natural gas and the pipeline that you can see on the screen relies on an increase in gas production out of the Northeast. Approximately 5.5 billion cubic feet of gas are produced in a day. 
LNG Canada at full build out requires another 4.0 uh, billion cubic feet a day. So you need to go from 5.5 to 9.5 on full build out. You can also see that there's um, been a lot, of, and you know there's been a lot of forestry development, agriculture development, and in the development of all those industries, there's roads, there's highways, there's power lines, there's seismic lines. So what picture does that give us? That's the picture of our lands, of Soto lands. Now this is a disturbance layer developed in 2018 and yes, there's a, two, there's a 250 meter buffer on top of the disturbance, but you can see, well, what's left there that you can, you can um, practice your treaty rights and your way of life. There's too much disturbance on the land right now. So it's not like Soto and other Treaty 8 member, uh, nations have been doing nothing. Um, but I want to tell you about two things that Soto's been doing to take back control of our territory. Here's a couple of examples. Robert mentioned this. Soto signed an agreement with West Moberly and uh, Canada and British Columbia in February of 2020 to take back control of Moose, or sorry, of Caribou. This is the Caribou Partnership Agreement. You can see the maps in the top right-hand corners. You can see the, all the red areas that um, the herds have been extirpated. Extir Someone say the word. Extirpated. Thank you. And you can see all the red areas where uh, the moose or where the caribou used to be. I, I will get the moose. I'm excited to talk about moose. Anyways, I'm talking about caribou. And you can see what's been going on. And so one of the, the key aspects of the Caribou Partnership Agreement was actually uh, developing uh, ma maternal penning. And uh, you can see the highlighted, uh, the couple yellow, yellow dots on the map there, where these guarded maternal pens were, were, were mature or pregnant um, caribou and their newborn calves are protected. So before this project started, the, the herd up there had 16 moose, 16 caribou left. Why am I? Anyways, I'm so excited to talk about moose again. So the work that's been happening is the current population has gone from 16 to 135. The success rate of, of caribou, let's see, I got it right. Caribou calves has gone from 30% to 60%. So it's doubled by having uh, the ability to uh, manage the predation. So what's been causing the problem? It's kind of a really interesting cycle on the land base. And what that is, is the cycle has been that as there's been so much harvesting forestry, you remove the trees, lots of browse grows up. The browse attracts Lots of moose, now I get it right. The moose <coughs> attract, attract wolves. And the wolves then go, hey, wait a minute. It's easier to kill and hunt caribou than it is moose. And so that is the cycle that we're trying to manage, protect, and change. We have to return a balance to the land base and the caribou agreement and implementation of that is, is trying um, to, to reach that. This, the other aspect that we've been working on has been the RCEA, the Regional Strategic Environmental Assess Assessment. And you can see the idea of that working with seven other Treaty 8 uh, nations. We were trying to use the results of the assessments to optimize the meaningful exercise of Treaty 8 rights with the development interests of the parties. So we've been working under the Environmental Stewardship Initiative for the last seven years in developing information. So what have we found out? Well, we found out that the land base is red. You can see the current condition reports on, the, on there. And you can see 
in the middle one, Old Forest. We analyzed 75 landscape units, and you can see that 63 of them are basically deemed to be at high risk. So the other aspect is 70 to 90% of the entire land base, and that it references back to my earlier slide, um, has been overly disturbed. So it should come as a surprise to nobody that reality came home in June of 2021 when the BC Supreme Court made a decision that BC had breached his obligations under Treaty 8 and uh, that the cumulative impacts of resource development um, exceeded what the treaty had originally envisioned would happen. BC chose to not um, take that, that decision back to court. They also recognized at the same time that yes, it was the Yehi decision with the Blueberry River First Nations, but that other Treaty 8 nations had a legal right to the same cumulative effects and would be, would be able to launch successful litigation cases. So what ended up happening was the province established a task force to work with Treaty 8 nations where we wanted to come up with new and creative solutions to address the cumulative effects in the Treaty 8 territories. And one of the things that we said was the processes that BC used going in can't be the processes that BC used coming out. You've had your time. We need something new. So there were some really important aspects to these negotiations to SOTO um, that I want to highlight in the next couple slides. And I'm going to talk about the outcomes of two issues that we dealt with. There was multiple issues. If you want to have more detail, come talk to me. But I'm going to talk about two. The first one is the management of moose. So in May of this year, I think it was May, we ended up with a, a completely new moose management regime in the Northeast that you can see here. There was no limited entry, there was no regulation of moose harvesting in the Northeast prior to the recent decision. It was an open season. So in the past, there's been upwards of 1,300 moose harvested um, by over 7,000 hunters on the land base within Treaty 8 territory. Going forward, we negotiated a 50% reduction and the development of limited entry hunting. So 650 moose, 3,500 uh, hunters on the land base. So, you know, this is a very complicated decision. If you've got questions on it, come see me afterwards. I can go through the details if you're more interested. However, I do want to highlight that Soto's territory is in, is in 732. You can see Moberly Lake between 732 and 731. That's Moberly Lake with um, where it's situated with West Moberly and Soto. 732 is Soto's backyard. In the past, there's been 250 moose harvested in that area. 20% of all the moose have been harvested in 732. I can report that there's been certain years in the last number of years where a Soto member has harvested zero. Let me just say that again. 20% of all the moose in the Northeast have been harvested in 732, and Soto members have harvested zero moose. So, the world has now changed. Going forward, the limited entry hunting actually says that there's a, a vast area um, in, the, uh, in and around the 7 of the 732 is actually fully closed to hunting, referred to as the Peace Moberly Track. And then the remainder of 732 now has a limited entry hunting uh, number of 50. So there'll be no more than 50 um, moose harvested by uh, non-treaty eight members. 
The other thing that was very important to, um, to Soto was the, the world of uh, creative solutions brought forward by future planning. And this is referred to as the South of the Peace Plan. Uh, you kind of look at uh, from the, um, uh, south, the Peace River South, and you can see where the, each of the nations are on that process. But we want to take back control of the lands. And we're, going to, and we're going to take that control back. We're going to reduce new, um, uh, we're going to limit new, and we're going to reduce the um, future disturbance. We're going to work together. We're going to bring ecosystem protection onto the land base. We're going to do the things that you can see on there. The one bullet, this is the problem with developing a, a PowerPoint over a week ago. The bullet that I forgot to put at the very bottom not only are we going to advance new protected areas, we're also going to work on nature-based solutions, a new way of looking at how the land is managed and what you do with that. We need to value a tree um, as a little bit more than a two by four. And we will be doing that going forward. So the work that we've done on the pre-feasibility work has been very important to actually help us understand, well, what's the art of the possible? And so thanks to Krista and Ikora for putting together these slides. And Robert kind of talked about it, but if you look at the just the caribou zones that you can see here, that if you started to move the caribou zones from the, the management to protection, that there's a million hectares, 50,000 hectares of THLB, you could create 27,000 tons of carbon in a year. Is that, I'm saying that right, Krista? The other note, the footnote on this, it excludes the hatched area, which is the tree farm license within that uh, timber supply area. So that's just the start of uh, the potential. The other aspect that you have within the caribou zones is, is the term afforestation. So what if you re, uh, replanted all the seismic lines, all the pipelines, all the roads? There's another 12,000 hectares that could be rehabilitated there. Now, that could produce 24,000 tons. This has a very high cost of, um, of, of planting, and you know that could be a barrier on this aspect. But you can see that there's a couple of aspects that we um, analyzed on what to do within the caribou zones that actually offer uh, some potential here. The other thing to, um, to be aware of is that from the Arcea outcomes, we were talking about potentially doing some other, you know, what if you bring the old growth targets into the white areas on these maps? So there's other um, opportunities for nature-based solutions and uh, that will be happening as we move, our, our move, move forward. So, how are we gonna do all this? Well, we're gonna do it by coming together and working together. We are no longer working as a government to government. Government has done it well enough to us. We are going to work government with government on a go-forward basis. We're going to prioritize the culturally and traditionally important areas and those spiritual areas that are important to Soto are going to be mapped and are going to be identified and will be, will be not harvested going forward. We want to ensure that there's a healthy ecosystem as well as um, appropriate economic development. If we reach that balance, we then have the ability to have a meaningful exercise of Treaty 8 rights. So that's the work that we're going to do. We're going to do, if we do it together, we can succeed. So thank you. And um, I just leave, um, as part of this, my, um, my contact information. 
uh, Ryan's contact information. And uh, uh, so thank you for your uh, listening to my speech today. Thank you, <clears throat> Gary. There's not uh, that many people in the room that know just how historic that speech was, and we can tell you about it at lunchtime. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're going a little bit further east uh, to Halfway River Territory, and uh, Jason Smith is here to present for a Halfway River. Over to you, Jason. Right, thank you. I just want to thank all the other presenters from other nations that went before me. There was so much echoed there that I know uh, really match as well the experiences that Halfway has had and the kind of things that Halfway wants to see change moving forward. So um, I feel like I could just say what she said, what he said, what she said. But um, and uh, you know, Executive Chairperson Brian Tate from Nishka started at the beginning talking about the impact of industrial development on Halfway's traditional territories a long history. And then uh, Gary and Robert talked a lot about, about more details on that history and, and some of the, the recent decisions and changes that are happening. And Krista, after me, is going to talk about some of the specific numbers and opportunities, the scale of the opportunity for nature-based solutions um, on the various nations that have been part of this. And so I'm going to take a little bit different tact. I'm going to talk about kind of the strategic fit between how Halfway wants to manage their land base and the outcomes they want to see on their traditional territory and carbon. So Halfway's done, had decades of work articulating and spatializing values that are important to them. Um, there's a wide range of values that you can see a bunch of them up here on the slide. You know, you've got a bunch of um, uh, environmental values like water quality, uh, wildlife habitat, You've got cultural values like spiritual places, visual quality. Um, and then you've got economic values like um, sustainable economy and jobs. And a lot of these, you know, you could kind of, these all kind of fall into different buckets, but there's a lot of overlap and integration. I don't think Halfway really sees this as a bunch of separate things they have to manage for. I mean, food's a good example. They need good hunting. Well, that's, that's, food. That's also cultural. That's how they obtain their cultural food supply. Um, that's economic because food is a resource that their communities require to live. And then the food is, is the wildlife and the plants that there's the, the um, environmental component. So I think that's kind of a, a key theme that goes forward in how Halfway thinks about managing the land base is that, that integration of values and thinking about there's, you're not really managing things in silo. You're managing the whole ecosystem, the whole land base together, and, and the halfway community as part of that. So typically, um, you know, halfway and well, managing the land base have to think about this balance of resource and values. And so on the, the left-hand side of this little tippy scale here, you've got kind of the traditional way of getting economic value, which has been impact benefit sharing. And that's been about it. And there's a whole bunch of other values that are important that often are at odds with the, the economic benefit that Halfway has historically derived from the land base. Um, cultural area protection, wildlife habitat and travel corridors, um, other env environmental priorities, cultural values. And so one of the ways that, that Halfway sees maybe carbon fitting into how they want to manage the land base is it can kind of tip the scale a bit. It allows them to de-emphasize some of the traditional sources of economic value that don't play very nice, don't overlap very well with, with the other range of values they want to manage the land base for. So maybe it tips the scale a little bit in, in that direction. And so much like, like Robert talked about and Gary and Cassandra, everyone talked about, um, ha Halfway's done a ton of work um, mapping values, trying to understand um, how they overlap, where they occur in the area, and the types of management that's necessary to, to, to manage for, for the range of values and kind of bring it all together. A good example of that is a mapping of spatial management zones they've done. And uh, you can see these in the, 
the green and the red for, uh, or the red and the green for preservation and, and high conservation zones. And these, again, these are not just about wildlife habitat. They're not just about, you know, moose hunting habitat. They're looking at all the different things they want to have happen in the land base. And they're saying there's certain types of management that needs to happen in certain places to have the land base operate the way it needs to for halfway. And these areas um, are associated with well-defined management actions that could affect carbon. Um, there's afforestation in terms of restoring seismic lines in other disturbed areas. Um, there's just flat-out protection that needs to happen um, to, to mitigate the historical impact of, of industrial development. And then there's you know, various um, other factors that, that bring that together, like management corridors and how different parts of the landscape connect together. And then going down from the, the landscape level, there's also site level strategies. So I mentioned afforestation. So that's, there's some very specific things that need to happen at the site level to make that happen. And Robert talked a bit about that. Um, Gary talked about that. It's expensive stuff and really challenging stuff. And it's often not economically feasible if you just think of it in a traditional kind of forestry perspective. You're looking at restoring forestry. And so there's, there's costs. So carbon is maybe one way to help mitigate some of those. And then they're looking at, 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 again, at the site level, managing a cut block design and thinking about improving the cut blocks for habitat. You know, things like residual ret retention you can see kind of scattered throughout there. And then there's these um, wildlife patch connectivity sections and how we manage waste and debris. All these things, this is kind of a, a new a change from how historically forest management has been done on halfway's territory, and there's a cost associated with that. There's, there's less timber revenue, and that impacts the current managers of the tenure, and it will impact halfway in the future. And so carbon is another way to maybe help, help mitigate some of the cost of these decisions, these trade-offs that halfway needs to make. So how to make this all happen? How do we move forward? Well, right now I have up here, the, uh, the new current system is broken. And it's broken because there's too many people managing the land base for a whole range of objectives. And often very, each, each kind of responsible party is managing for a very narrow range of objectives. You've got you know, timber companies out there managing for timber revenue, oil and gas companies managing for oil and gas revenue. And most of the economic objections uh, or outcomes are occurring to people that aren't actually impacted by the negative effects of the management that's happening on the land base. And so this whole, all these trade-offs and this integration I'm seeing that's need to happen, it can't happen because the decisions are being made in little silos all over the place. And you know, Halfway's involvement historically, the way that they've been able to be involved is through very site level consultation exercises. So here, talk about what's happening in this 40 hectare cut block or this well pad. And that's not how you make decisions that are integrating a range of values across 300 and something thousand hectares um, that, that halfway traditional territory extends over. And I think the disconnection of carbon and timber, kind of getting back to what we're talking about, um, is a really good example of that. And Robert Seaton touched on this a bit. The incentive right now, you know, if you're a forced tenure holder and you're making decisions on where to harvest, is if you have a stand that's just marginally economically positive for timber, you're going to harvest it because the only other alternative is to not harvest it and there's less revenue. It's a pretty simple decision. But as not acknowledging the carbon benefit associated with not harvesting it. It might actually exceed the timber value, just in pure economic terms in some of those marginal stands. And then there's all the other benefits we talked about, the cultural and wildlife. Well, if you've got someone that their full mandate is to only consider timber revenue, they're going to make a bad decision overall. And so that's why I think the system's broken. And so halfway's position is, is, is you know, we need a single manager that can actually understand the full range of trade-offs need to happen and make these decisions and have, you know, incentives that are properly aligned with, with how we want the, man, the land base to look in the future. And so moving forward, Halfway is looking to work with government to secure uh, the rights to carbon and other management decisions across a significant extent of their traditional territory. 
and carbon's a key part of it because halfway still needs to support their communities and build schools and put food on the table. So economic return to the community is an important part of it, but it's balancing it against all the other things that they need to manage the land base for too. So carbon is one piece of that. And that's all I have for you today. So thank you for taking time to listen to me. Thanks very much, Jason. Um, so we've all been uh, hearing about Krista. And um, dear, she's actually here larger than life um, and uh, really uh, stepped up um, on behalf of ACORA uh, to, to uh, assist a number of the nations who've presented uh, to undertake the, the analysis that they've undertaken and um, uh, really did a great job. Uh, everyone has told me that, Krista. So. I believe it, and I, I know you well enough to know you would do nothing else. So uh, thanks for being here and for uh, stepping up. Over to you. All right. Thank you and everybody <laughs> for your kind words. Um, so before this, you've heard from all the other nations about their motivations, um, their individual situations in their traditional territories. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the collective numbers, um, what they, you know, the aggregation of each of the nation's pre-feasibility um, analyses that I, I had the good fortune to, to work with a lot of, not all of them, but, but uh, quite a few of them on um, to, to kind of translate their ideas about um, the important uh, things they want to do on their land base into into estimates of carbon. Um, so for this presentation, I'm basically taking um, the highlights from like a rolled up summary that we've done for the FNCI. Um, so this map you've kind of seen before, um, uh, but again, it, it shows all the nations and the areas that they are, are considering uh, considering their um, MBS projects on. Um, so there's six nations included in this summary. Uh, the, the hatched one there is Nishka, you heard from, from Warren at the start. Um, so they are well on their way to uh, getting numbers from their uh, pre-feasibility study or feasibility studies, but we didn't have time to incorporate it into the roll-up. Um, so for the six nations um, that are located in kind of the, the central uh, part of BC along the CGL pipeline, um, it covers around about 10% of the province's area. Um, that's like gross area. But then when we did the math, you know, through the, through the projects, it also covers, you know, it's pretty proportional to the forested area of BC and also um, the timber harvest land base. So it's about 10% of the harvestable, what is considered the harvestable area of BC as well. Um, and each of the projects that you've heard about, you know, they're, you've heard they're very specific to, they're based on each individual nation's um, needs. Um, but for the purpose of this summary, we've kind of lumped them together into three main types, um, into uh, protection, so like protection conservation type projects is the first one, uh, afforestation projects being the second one where, uh, where you're planting trees, and um, improved forest management, kind of the suite of, of, of mechanisms that go with improved forest management for the third type. But recognizing that, you know, there's no, through this process, we've kind of seen that there's no cookie cutter or one size fits all um, answer. It's really important that uh, each nation, um, you know, their individual needs situation on the land base. So um, yeah, for each of these projects, I'm gonna kind of talk about the areas that are involved, kind of how big are they, um, how much carbon can we expect, and then kind of translating that into carbon offsets and, and estimates of economics with disclaimers all over them. Um, okay, so the first type of project we're talking about is the log to protected forest. So that's basically conservation projects or, um, or protection projects. So every single nation has identified areas that they want to protect. Shows you how important it is. Um, and uh, the, the shots to the side here, to the left here, kind of show um, spatially defined areas from three different nations. So the top one is the the, the biodiversity management areas that you heard about from Cassandra and Saika's territory. Um, the second one down are uh, areas 
riparian buffers that uh, Heisler has said are really important to protect. Um, the third one uh, at the bottom are the, the management zones from, from Halfway River First Nation. So when you look at the table there and you see, uh, you can add up all the areas, um, it, it adds up to roughly about half a million hectares of timber harvest land base. So that's not the area of forest, that's the area of forest within these boundaries that are likely to be harvested in the future. So if you're looking um, at the total area of forest, it's about 1.3 million hectares, um, of which point half a million hectares are, uh, are timber harvest land base, or THLB. Um, so, and for these type of projects, like it's important to note that, and, it, and, the, and the pictures on the left show that, that the nations have a really good idea of what they want to protect, where they want to protect it. Um, in a lot of cases, they've been developed under existing um, processes, uh, you know, there's, a, there's not too much uncertainty here about what could be done um, and you could get rolling on these types of projects relatively quickly. So what does that mean in terms of carbon um, for locked protective forests? Um, this is kind of what the this first graph here shows, like a, a roll up, the, the bars are stacked for each nation, but you can roughly see on this, if you protect this half a million hectares, um, of timber harvest land base, uh, you'll get about sequestration rates of a million tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year, so about a million tons. Um, and this is fairly consistent across the 100 years. Um, <clears throat> it's a good estimate of the rate. Um, on the second graph here, it kind of tries to translate it into um, offsets and uh, dollars, I guess. So. Um, for the purpose of this project, um, you'll hear that it's quite specific. The, the reductions are used are quite specific for projects. They're based on, um, but the big three are leakage, risk of reversal, and, and allowances for foregone storage and harvested wood products. Um, and so in the absence of a detailed project um, to, to work off for these estimates, we we kind of get, we estimated a range of values and did a bunch of Monte Carlo simulations, generated a median value, and this is what you're seeing in the graphs. So in the report, there are uh, estimates of range and confidence intervals that go with these, uh, because we recognize that, you know, it's, it's kind of a guess, it's very project specific. This is just specifically for the purpose of giving you a, uh, a general estimate of scale. Um, so if you look at the first 20 years, um, which is you know what everyone is more interested in from an economic perspective. From protecting this half a million hectares, you could expect around about uh, 450,000 credits per year, roughly, after those uh, reductions from the total sequestration down to the number of offsets. Um, and taking the net step from offsets to dollars has its own set of um, of uncertainty uh, th factors and is. Also very specific, depends on the protocol, the markets, blah, blah, blah. But if we wrap that all in a box and just say, you know, what if we assume 20 bucks a ton, um, specifically for the goal of this illustrating the, the magnitude of the opportunity, that would work out to about $9 million per year, roughly, from these projects flowing through to uh, the nations, you know, as you, as you can see in the proportions from the, the stacked bars. Okay, so the second type of project is that we've, we're talking about rolling up to is the afforestation types of projects. Um, you heard from Nishka, who has um, some quite a quite a lot of area actually in the Nass bottomlands that they're looking at uh, planting or um, yeah reforesting. But in in this roll up, we're talking about um, the nations in the east, so halfway in Salto. They have identified. Um, areas for planting, um, seismic lines, pipelines, roads, um, those type of things. Um, and they've identified them in a subset of their land base. So this 50,000 hectares of priority areas, that's not by no means the, the total uh, area that is disturbed by these types of linear disturbances and the fragmentation. Um, the 36,000 hectares, for example, um, identified by halfway is about 18% of the total uh, disturbance of these types in that area. So this afforestation um, estimate is based on you know, more 
realist, a realistic proportion of the total. And, and there's a lot, there's obviously a lot more areas that, that could be planted. Um, so planting the, this uh, roughly 50,000 hectares, um, over 100 years works out to an additional 35 million tonnes of CO2E um, stored. Uh, that rate, if you, if you look at just the 20-year the rate, so when the trees are smaller and they're not sequestering carbon quite as fast, it's about a rate of 175,000 tonnes a year. Um, after reductions for leakage and risk, um, that works out to about 150,000 credits a year or 3 million bucks a year. But for, I mean, for afforestation, the big problem is not the potential area or, and not the, um, don't have to convince anyone that it's a good thing, but it's, it is very expensive. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, the linear, you know, the, the linear type disturbances in the Northeast are the, the estimates, you know, around about $10,000 a hectare to plant or to restore. So that, um, that means that for to pursue a sizable afforestation um, project, you, you definitely need to be looking around for alternative sources of funding um, because just the revenue from carbon up there, given the growth rates and everything, is not enough to, to cover the, the expensive planting costs. Okay, and then the third type of project that we've we've kind of rolled them all up into is this improved forest management bucket. Um, and improved forest management projects, they can encompass a number of alternative um, management mechanisms, such as long, longer rotations, uh, partial harvesting, uh, riparian reserves. Um, and they have this really great opportunity, like it's an exciting opportunity to affect lot of change in how forests are managed over large areas, territorial areas, like your whole territory going forward. Um, but, uh, and, and that adds up to for, in the case of Heisler, Saikus and Salto, that adds up to about like over a million hectares of the timber harvesting land base. Like they're quite big areas that you can affect change over. But um, as we were looking to model these improved forest management um, type projects, kind of came to the realization that the, you know, unlike protection and afforestation, the, the, the exact mechanisms, the, the exactly what you want to do where um, is largely still to be decided or, or needs to be worked out. Um, so in this specific, uh, for, this, for this estimate, we used, uh, we approximated the magnitude based on um, harvest level reductions of 10 to 20%, um, just to give an idea of what, what the magnitude for carbon might be. But, it definitely comes with um, disclaimers, you know, that these are rougher numbers than the other two uh, than the other two ones because of this. There's a little bit more uncertainty with with uh, with these, and it really highlights the need for um, the next steps. You need to do kind of integrated landscape planning for carb like considering carbon, um, in order to uh, optimize the benefits to the nations and also the the greenhouse gas. Um, emissions and you heard that um, in a different way from from West Moberly um, from from Robert I think he said it really well but but what I've found from working with the nations is that that's not unique that's not, uh, you know um, to do these improved forest management projects well um, to the benefit of all parties is going to take a bit of work um, so what we look at for in terms of carbon from, from these initial estimates is that over this million hectares is that if you reduce the harvest rate between 10 and 20%, um, you'll get over 100 years, you'll get an extra 21 million tonnes of CO2e. Um, and you'll notice kind of the shape of the curve far, far out is uh, kind of, uh, it's not a, a straightforward, you know, upwards trend like, like the other two. And that's kind of to do with um, how we uh, modeled Soto's strategy uh, for, for um, uh, getting towards fulfilling the old growth targets quickly. So um, we made some pretty simplistic assumptions about how their strategy might play out, you know, 60 plus years out in the future. Um, but that would be refined with a full feasibility analysis and it doesn't affect the first 20 years of the calculation. Um, so then if we 
you know, focus in again on the on the short shorter term, um, that would be sequestration rates of about 600,000 tons per year. Um, if we do the next step again, we 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 knock that down for uh, for reductions, uh, leakage risk, that kind of stuff, um, by about 60%. Uh, that gives us uh, 250,000 credits per year for the first 20 years, or about or revenues of five million bucks per year from these from these projects, potential projects. Um, so to wrap it all up, we have um, summarized the, the results for six nations that cover around about 10% of the province. So that gives you an idea of how much more it could be, you know, 10%, that's easy to do the math. Um, on, the, on these areas, they have so far identified uh, half a million hectares of protection, um, 50,000 hectares of afforestation areas to be planted, and uh, over a million hectares to be managed under um, improved forest management. And I got to say that that's just so far. So this is the first round of kind of um, planning and thinking about these types of opportunities. There's lots more, and I'm sure that as um, people listen to other people's presentations here and think, oh, that, that sounds like a great idea too. So um, there's a lot more opportunities within the territories, um, for sure. But from the ones that have been identified so far, there's about 1.5 million tons of CO2e per year, which after um, reductions for leakage risk and all that kind of stuff, translates to offsets of about, uh, for the next 20 years, on average, um, 850,000 credits per year, or, or revenue streams of about 17 million per year. So, in a nutshell, that's what the pre-feasibility pre analyses have shown. Um, and yeah, I've come away from this exercise, I'd say, feeling quite positive. I feel like these numbers are, you know, fairly big. We can contribute to um, improving a global problem, but, uh, but I mean, also at the local level, there's so much potential to, um, to affect real change in the communities and, and across the, the ecosystems and the, and the land bases that, that are their territories. So yeah, I'm happy to be part of the solution. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Krista. Okay, uh, it's 12.15 and uh, you've all been sitting, um, but some of you are very enthusiastic about this stuff and may have some questions. Um, so I'm just going to say a few things while you think about what those questions are, and we'll take a few. And we'll try and create additional opportunities. So over the next two days, if there's something you really wanted to talk about right now and didn't get a chance, just come and see me in a break, and we'll figure out where to fit that in. Because it's going to get more flexible tomorrow and the next day, because we're not going to be in this super souped up hybrid environment. Uh, with oh boy doing an amazing job. Thank you. Oh boy um, <clears throat> And we'll be able to adapt the agenda a bit a bit better So there's a, a program called Slido uh, You may have it running if you've got Slido you can post questions uh, On Slido and I'm speaking to the 65 people that are watching this virtually right now um, You are welcome to post questions um, and if we don't get to them, we'll try and get to them later also, those of you in the room, um, if you'd rather just speak your question, I'll repeat it into the microphone so others can hear. Um, just want to thank you again, Krista, uh, for doing that roll-up analysis and, and supporting the nations in, in getting a sense of what the opportunity might be. And um, <clears throat> really want to emphasize that you know, every one of those presentations wasn't about the carbon and it wasn't about the money. Uh, it was about restoring the land and uh, recovering the ecosystems and recovering the salmon and the moose and the caribou and, and all of the other biodiversity that depends on those ecosystems. And um, there aren't enough Christas around uh, to tell us just what the benefits would be if you did all of that. And, and you can only imagine that if you 
it wasn't it was a protecting 500,000 hectares of THLB but that was in a, a million 1.3 million hectares of land and if you were to do that and restore the seismic lines and the roads and all of those other things that could be done what would it look like then and how many moose would there be and how much easier would it be for Soto and West Moberly and others to recover those caribou herds so I want to take us back there to some extent because it isn't about just about carbon that's important but it's also about all the other species uh, and and the other values that are in the forest and and it's not just about forests um, and I want to just mention again uh, to those nations that are here that haven't participated in this process and would like to uh, just reach out to us you're very welcome to uh, participate and uh, the doors open and would really like you to so I don't uh, see any questions online and I'm gonna ask if anybody has any here just raise a hand and we'll give you a chance and otherwise we're gonna break for lunch Okay, any, uh, any, any final words from any of our leadership here, First Nations leadership? Herb, we'll just bring you a mic. Is that working? Yeah. This is not the final word. Yeah, this is not the final word for me. It means to run away. I was born in Getacht Amix, our original community of our nation, our community. I'm in this club, and I'm a Lachkibu. I'm from the Wolf tribe. And it was my maternal grandmother who greeted me when I came into this world. So, I just wanted to say thank you, first of all, to our brothers and sisters from the Skopmis and the Musqueam for opening their hearts to us, for us to be able to converse with each other, to talk about some things that are sacred to us how we can actually begin to bring our lives more fully into the mainstream with our values of our ancestors. We have a language that when we translate English into our language, we can go deeper in terms of understanding what that one word is. Some years ago, um, I was working for, uh, this is what happens to us. I was working with a, a survey crew. Bringing a pipeline through our lands. And this young man came up to me because my responsibility to that group was to talk or to share what was sacred with us, for us. And uh, he said, where is your sacred land? So I said, uh, oh, lift your foot. I said, lift your foot. So he did. I said, what's under your foot? He said, a blade of grass. I said, what does the grass do? He said, it grows. I said, therefore, it has a spirit. And it's sacred. Anything that has a spirit is sacred to us. So you're standing on our sacred land. This is where we can go to take what it is that works on we're working to share. I talked to Alex this morning about changing my vocabulary and I'm still having a difficult time with it. I've changed my vocabulary to say, instead of saying trying to, 
I'm working to. Because when I started healing and trying to reconcile all the things that I experienced in my life, I was always saying try and didn't seem to. This is what happens when you say try. But when you change your vocabulary to say, I am working to and I will continue to work to, things start looking up. The spirit of our lands that you heard, the sacredness of it, what is left when you take without respect? What is left when you just assume that you have an authority to do it? In our world, pre-contact, our ancestors used to ask, I need a tree. I need a cedar tree to carve a pole. We don't say no. Our ancestors didn't say no. They said, take what you need. Take what you need. And one of the things about our nation is that you heard Doug talk about having a hooligan grease with some dried fillets of fish. Well, in March, our nation opens the doors to our neighbors to come and harvest Olokin and to work for it. Our ancestors say, Giladzima Simbwasit Wuneh at Ligitna. Don't ever put a price on food to anyone. When you do that, to me, it will be taken from us. We will lose it. Because we're not treating it as a gift to enhance our lives. And that's who we are. Today, I was talking to McKay here, McKay. I went to a fisheries uh, co-management workshop at UBC in the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, the facilitator was a lady. And the whole group of people participating were men. And uh, everyone gave their presentations. And she, she asked, are there any questions? So I started looking around the room, you know. I, you know what's... But no one put their hand up. So I put mine up. I said, I don't have a question but I have an observation I'd like to share. I wish my mother was here. I wish my grandmother was here. I wish my wife was here. I wish my sisters were here. And I wish our daughters were here. And as I looked around the room, there was a kind of a quizzical look from people. I said, the reason I say that, I said, is our mothers provide us with what we need, not what we want. Our mothers understand diversity. 
because each of us born into a family are diverse in nature. Our thinking, the way we look at things are different from each other. And they know how to maintain harmony because when we have these little battles within the family, they allow us to have those, but then they share with us why we shouldn't. And it's up to us to accept that and live with it. We don't seem to apply our respective understandings of diversity and the complex nature of the environment. Each of you came here with a life gift. How are you going to apply it to enhance life within our nation, on our land? What did you bring here? To share, I'm, I'm not a good hunter. Not a very good fisherman. Really, not very good at physical work. But I have a compassion for words, a passion for words, not a compassion, for, a passion for words, our language, to understand it more deeply and share it. Just the way I'm speaking to you today is the way I speak to our children and our youth. Trusting them to begin to understand it so that they could live it. So what did you bring to today that's going to enhance my life? so that I can share it to enhance others. That's who I am. I went to a residential school, but I refused to let them take my language away. I was teaching others how to speak in our language. I really appreciated it. That video from your presentation, Cassandra, because it showed without fear what happens when we're not included. The starkness of it. That's why when this young man asked me to show him where our sacred lands were, all it took was to ask him to lift his foot. Because we're living and understanding. We had a young lady visit our nation from Austria. <clears throat> And she wanted to understand the Niskat's perspective and understanding of the, state, the spiritual relationship they had with the land and the environment. How do you answer a question like that? I was introduced to her, so I took her out to the land. I introduced her to the trees and told the trees that she had arrived. You already knew she was going to be here. So now fill her with what you have to offer. Let her understand what you have to offer. And then I turned to her and asked her to speak to the same trees in their language. And she stood there speechless. Why? 
because she didn't think her, her father was a spiritual person who was a farmer who had the understanding of spirit which is what he grew and shared. She didn't understand that she said her mother wasn't spiritual, but her mother was able to grow plants on the walls of their house. And those plants were trusting her mother in a spiritual way to grow. And she said that her grandfather wasn't spiritual because all he did was walk to the forest and disappeared. And yet her grandfather was spending his time in the most spiritual place within our land, in the forest near the water. So I said to her, <clears throat> when you leave here, Trust yourself enough to speak to trees in public so that you can begin to live your spiritual request that you're making about the environment, the relationship there. How many of you remember Fido? Fido had a blimp flying around Vancouver some years ago. And I remember this day really clearly because it was so hot in August. Man, it was hot. And so I, I, I was starting to panic because it was getting too hot for me. So I took my suit, I saw this little tree growing on the grass. I mean, in, with the grass. And there was shade on the grass on one part. So I took my shoes off and my socks, and I placed my foot on the shady part, and it was cool. Oh, yeah. Then I placed it in the sun, and it was hot. So I was standing there, took my shoes off, waiting for her daughter to come out of the paint shop. And I stood there against her, and there was this one little Asian guy. He was standing there watching me. Hey, what you do? No shoes, no sock. I said, come and try it, man. It's cool here. And he refused for a fun. He relented and he came. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. So trees, grass, together in its creating shade, work together to make you cool in a block of cement like a city. when you're looking for it and you understand what you're looking for and you find it, you share it. Thank you for listening to me. Share. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Herb. We have a request, uh, Herb, if it's okay. We have a request from one of our online uh, participants. If you would uh, bless the food for lunch. This is a teaching from one of our leaders. He said, when you're asked to pray publicly, he said, ask everyone to stand and get them in the same space. Our, our daughters, our granddaughters, remind us all the time to bless those who have prepared the food with us, for us. But our people have always given thanks for the blessings of food, for those who have created because as we nurture through this, and they gave us, give us words while we're eating. That's how we receive knowledge. 
and when you apply knowledge, you receive wisdom. You're living wisdom. Amen. All my relations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Herb. And uh, lunch is served outside. We reconvene at 2 o'clock.